BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Nerd 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. And we have just a couple of quick announcements before we begin. The first is a big thank you to everyone who listened to the episode on the Anthrax Killer, and that is actually going to be a two-parter. It's called Hunting the Anthrax Killer, and it is going to conclude next Friday to anyone who is following these things as they come out. And if you're listening to this in the future, I have a two-part series on the Anthrax Killer. And it does one of the more... Well, I am just a fan of this, comparing the real-life stories to the dramatizations that are put forward in movies and TV shows, because I spend a lot of time talking about The Hot Zone, which is a six-part series that was actually done on Nat Geo. But then... It is, of course, released on the ABC app as well as the Hulu um, streaming service. I think that ABC, though, only has season one, which is about the Ebola virus, and that really isn't the true crime aspects that I truly like to get into. I did watch season one of The Hot Zone just because um, it was available for free on the ABC streaming app, but season two of The Hot Zone is all about the anthrax killer and the mysteries behind the letters that were mailed in 2001, and I will conclude that discussion next Friday, so please look out for that to anyone who's listening to these live, and in the future you can check out any of the Anything Goes segments. I also did a lot of comparing and contrasting real life to the dramatizations in a recent Anything Goes segment called The Unicorn Killer, the story of Ira Einhorn and Holly Maddox, also available here on the channel. I invite you guys to um, visit any of this material if you're curious. And the the miniseries that was made for that one was called The Hunt for the Unicorn Killer, about Ira Einhorn, who was somewhat of a spiritual guru to world leaders, for lack of a better term. Not even world leaders, but like people who had a lot of influence in the political world, and some people who were very well connected to the financial world. I mean, you can't really call them world leaders, I take that back, but he became very charming to the Seagram's family fortune, heirs and heiresses, and people like that. I mean, I guess those are the people who truly run the world, the people who are selling booze. And one more announcement to people who like hearing about the Zodiac Killer and all things true crime. Drew Beeson is getting up there and subscribers approaching 1,000. So if anybody hasn't subscribed to his channel yet, he hosts a program called The Zodcast on his show. That's the Drew Beeson channel, but the show is called The Zodcast. He has many other great true crime videos out there. Drew Beeson is the author of Sighting In on the Zodiac Killer as well as Paratrooper of Fortune, talking all about his D.B. Cooper suspect, Ted B. Braden. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's a great time to do so. Drew is getting close to a thousand, so please feel free to help out that channel. And subscribing does not require that much energy at all and absolutely zero cost. And I also noticed that Drew Beeson and Aaron Stoner had both done videos on the disappearance of Brian Schaefer, and that is a very, um, very uh, perplexing mystery all the same, especially once you get into some of the theories about what happened to Brian Schaefer, and I don't have an episode on his case myself, but Drew Beeson has one, and Aaron Stoner is a YouTuber who is really getting up there in terms of viewership, and I was even talking about him with someone saying, this guy, Aaron Stoner, is really going to make it big because he puts out a lot of content that I don't find on anyone else's channel, and I'll be saying a lot of those things about the Zodiac Killer today, but he had great things on the murder of Missy Beavers, as well as a video on the disappearance of Gabby Petito, which... I mean, really took off for him, and of course the disappearance of Brian Schaefer, so feel free to visit his channel as well. 
And one more time, you can hear an interview with David Icke on the Mystic Drop podcast. The YouTube channel is The Mystic Drop. It's hosted by Roberto Roya, and he interviewed the famed conspiracy theorist David Icke. And some people don't even view David Icke as a conspiracy theorist. They just view him as a commentator, someone who comments and so on life. And I really found that the material he was sharing on Roberto Roya's interview wasn't so much about the lizard people or about the um, sacred beliefs of the um, elites. I mean, he did talk about them, referring to them as the cult, but it was really just about commentary that he was just commenting on life, so to speak, available on the Mystic Drop channel. And finally, I have to give a shout out to Hot Rock Ricky, who started listening to Black Box Online Radio and contacted me at my Facebook page. There is a Facebook page for Black Box Online Radio, as well as my personal Facebook, and both of these are available in the description box. And another great way to uh, contact the show is Black Box Online Radio at AOL.com. But Hot Rock R- Ricky wrote into the comments, <laughs> sorry, wrote into the Facebook page section. And he asked me simply, what did I think about this? And there was a YouTube link that was in the message. So I decided to open it, and I was pleasantly surprised that I was drawn to the Nancy Drew YouTube channel. This is one that I had viewed in the past. A couple of people have recommended the videos on the Nancy Drew YouTube channel. And the full name is just Nancy Drew. I'm just going to be calling it the Nancy Drew YouTube channel because it's actually run by a guy, but... He has a couple suspect videos out there, and I thought that his theory about the um, Zodiac Killer suspect, John L. Johnson, was very interesting. I can't say that I agree with it, but one thing that I definitely appreciated from the Nancy Drew channel was he was looking at suspects that are off the radar, because so many people have written in the comments section here on Black Box Online Radio saying that they think that the Zodiac is going to be caught one day, that like DNA is going to reveal who it was, and it's going to be somebody who was completely off the radar. And this has happened more than once in times where DNA has revealed who did what or how something happened, or the forensic evidence ties something a hundred years after such and such happened. And... The person has already passed away. Oh, what was the name of the guy who um, was involved with the murder of Bryn Rainey? Was it Joseph Holt? He was an example of someone who was identified because of DNA years after he had passed away, and he most likely was the murderer of Bryn Rainey back in 1977. And the authorities said he wasn't even on the radar. A lot of people say that that's their theory about the Zodiac Killer. They don't endorse, subscribe, or think highly of any suspects out there. They think it's going to be someone that the police haven't looked at, that amateur sleuths haven't even looked at. And that's what the suspect, John L. Johnson, was supposed to be. The guy on the Nancy Drew channel said that the way you're going to find a suspect who's off the radar is looking in places that are off the radar. And what he did was he actually went through the directory of employment for one of the high schools in Vallejo in 1969, and he found this guy named John L. Johnson, who was a custodian, and he did a a short video about him. The thing about the Nancy Drew channel is that the The videos are actually very short. If you would like to just dive right into the information, they don't have this type of monologuing style that I do. They're about three, four, five minutes long, so I highly recommend this channel as well. But the video link that Hot Rod Ricky sent to me was not about John L. Johnson, and I was quite surprised. Instead, it was about a suspect named Rodney Hamlin. The name didn't ring any bells. I didn't recognize the name. But here's one name that perhaps you will recognize, Gary Francis Post. Some people are pronouncing it Posty. I've also heard it pronounced Post, so I'll just keep going with that. Gary Post is somebody who was not very well known to the world until about three months ago in the fall of D21. 
a group calling themselves the Case Breakers shared a lot of info about Gary Post, and they said that he's their Zodiac Killer suspect. They even said that they had solved the case, and the mainstream media outlets ran with it, and they started just saying that the case has been solved, that a team of investigators says that the Zodiac Killer case has not only been solved, but they've identified who the Zodiac was. But what they really left out is, this is just a group of people doing their own investigation, just proposing their own Zodiac Killer suspect. There are lots of groups out there, or individuals out there, who claim that they have found the Zodiac Killer, and they post all up and down the message boards about their chosen Zodiac Killer suspect, and I, I think you can get the idea. But Gary Post and Rodney Hamlin were business partners. Now, my first impression before going through um, all of the videos that the Nancy Drew channel had on Rodney Hamlin, was that he was going to be the full Zodiac suspect, like saying, okay, this group, the Case Breakers, maybe they didn't solve the case, maybe they were going down the right track, but they missed it by a step. They missed it by just a hair, and they got the wrong person. It's not Gary Post, it's Rodney Hamlin. Well, first I'll share some info about Rodney Hamlin. He was a guy who was 29 years old in 1969. He was around 5 feet 11 inches tall, and he worked as Gary Post's business partner in a painting company. And the painting company was called Pine Mountain Painting, and to the credit of the Nancy Drew channel, he actually dug up a lot of info that I thought was just very impressive finds for only having the short amount of time to learn about Gary Post. He even found the business card for Pine Mountain Painting, which was um, a real business, license number 338751, going to Rodney Hamlin and Gary Post. They're the two people on there in Groveland, California. And when they would put out their uh, listings in the phone book, it says that you could call either Rod Hamlin or Gary Post, Although uh, Gary Post's name was misspelled in the uh, phone book, and they had their phone numbers posted there. Now, some big differences with Rodney Hamlin is that it seems that Rodney Hamlin has a definitive connection to one of the Zodiac Killer victims. If the info that the Nancy Drew channel has uncovered is correct, and if I get anything wrong, I'm open to correction in the comments section down below. He can correct me if he happens to listen to this or if you've um, heard his videos. And if you think that I'm misinterpreting anything, please feel free to drop any suggestions. I'm always open to correction. But he has a direct connection to one of the Zodiac Killer victims, and of course, it is Darlene Farron. Now, Rodney Hamlin had a relative named Peggy Hamlin, who worked in Terry's Restaurant, the same restaurant where Darlene Farron was a server. The Zodiac Killer committed the Blue Rock Springs shooting on July 4th of 1969, and murdered Darlene Farron, as well as shooting Mike Majot, but Mike Majot would go on to survive. So, Darlene Farron and Peggy Hamlin would have had a connection. The, the part where I'm pretty sure I heard correctly, but I think that it just sounded a little bit weird, is he isn't completely sure if Peggy Hamlin is Rodney's sister or cousin, but she's a female relative of Rodney Hamlin. And um, I think that that is definitely something a little bit more impressive than what the case breakers have dug up about Gary Francis Post, the lines on the forehead, comparing a human to a cartoon, and the famous shadow on a piece of wood. I think I've said everything I had to say about Gary Post, and um, he is somewhat of a ridiculous suspect in, in my mind. However, there, is, there was an interesting illustration that was made on the Nancy Drew channel that talked about how Rodney Hamlin's ancestors, his, um, yeah, let's just say that his ancestors came from the lower Midwest, and then they moved to Brentwood, California, and then they moved to a small town called Pittsburgh, California. I didn't even know there was a Pittsburgh also in the state of California, and then if you look at the Zodiac 
scenes of um, the Zodiac crime scenes. First, you have Lake Hermit Road, which occurred on uh, December 20th of 1968, the first confirmed Zodiac crime, which saw the murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. The second confirmed Zodiac incident was on July 4th of 1969, the Blue Rock Springs shooting, as I um, was talking about, where Darlene Farron was murdered. And it's almost as if there could be a straight line from Brentwood, California, to Pittsburgh, California, to Lake Herman Road, to Blue Rock Springs. But then again, how exactly would the additional Zodiac crimes fit in? I mean, I just think that um, even if even if Rodney Hamlin is not the Zodiac killer or Gary Post is not the Zodiac killer, I just think that's um, a rather interesting observation and... I don't I didn't even really hear this too much in his videos. Instead, I heard that oh I mean I mean I just kind of saw it very clearly in his illustration which he created and I drew in an additional line looking at how it's almost completely straight among these four places, but you could just be like, well it's the Bay Area, people are just moving closer to a larger city and that's the explanation that you have there. So, um there's also a lot of, I guess, complications with somebody like Rodney Hamlin, because at first I thought that the Nancy Drew channel was suggesting that he was the Zodiac Killer, but I I believe it's in episode 75, yes, his episode's numbered, and the 74, 75, 76 are all about Rodney Hamlin, including episode 91. I think it's in episode 75 when he said that it is unlikely that Rodney Hamlin would have committed all the murders. He actually suggested that Gary Post was the trigger man. I don't know if he's endorsing Gary Post as a Zodiac Killer suspect completely, but I think if we're going to talk about these two guys, then I'm not liking the methodology. I mean, if I can be very blunt with you, that's just taking a Zodiac Killer suspect who up until four months ago was not connected to the mystery at all, other than through people like Dale Julin, who was looking into this, and he says he found the Zodiac, and 40 people in the case breakers have latched on to this, even though they haven't really revealed anything strong about Gary Post, other than his, um, I guess he had a scar on his forehead, and they match that to a composite sketch, even though the composite sketch does not have a scar on the suspect's forehead. Those were just lines that were drawn in by the artist, and I guess the um, simplest way of putting it, it seems that people think that those lines were drawn in to fill space so it wasn't completely blank in the forehead, but it may have also been done to uh, show age. Now, here is something interesting, though, about the case breakers and their approach to um, the Gary Post, uh, Rodney Hamlin connection. And this was another slide that was featured on the Nancy Drew channel, but it's, it is from Crime Traveler. On the other hand, Tom Colbert is a TV producer, a man with a product to sell, in this case a documentary. Tom also claims to know the identity of the hijacker D.B. Cooper and the final resting place of Jimmy Hoffa. Well, his uh, D.B. Cooper suspect was um, Robert Rackstraw, and I heard that it was rather dismantled by the History Channel, like more or less debunked. The final resting place of Jimmy Hoffa is very clearly under Giant Stadium. No, it's not. No, it's not. I shouldn't even make jokes. But here's a brief summary of Colbert's story. Colbert's team believes that the Zodiac Killer was Gary Francis Post, an Air Force veteran and painting contractor who lived in Alameda, California between 1963 and 1974. In addition to the five official Zodiac murders, the team also claims that Gary Post killed Kathy Jo Bates in Riverside, California, and Donna Lass in Lake Tahoe in 1970. Both these murders have been linked to the Zodiac by others. All right, I know some of you are about to explode right now. I was the first time I heard that, too. And, I mean, like, no matter where the stuff is coming from, Kathy Jo Bates, I have no idea who Kathy Jo Bates is. Sherry Jo Bates was killed in 1966, and some people believe that she was murdered by the Zodiac Killer. Sherry Josephine Bates murdered on October 30th of 1966. You see how the internet is running with things and going in some odd directions, and this whole Rodney Hamlin connection, whether he was the Zodiac or he was an active participant in planning the Zodiac murders, is that just not another case of... um? the internet taking an idea and running with it. 
and I really do appreciate all the effort the Nancy Drew channel has done digging up info on Rodney Hamlin, and I'm not going to lie to you if he were just to say, hey, the casebreakers got some points right, but um, they were looking at the wrong guy. It's actually the other business partner. I mean, perhaps Rodney Hamlet is an even better Zodiac Killer suspect than Gary Post. I'm still not convinced, but just saying. There's another point, though, about Donna Lass and Lake Tahoe in 1970. Both of these murders have been linked to the Zodiac by others. Excuse me, how on earth do we know that Donna Lass was murdered? I did a multi-part series on the disappearance of Donna Lass, which concluded last Thursday, actually. And Donna Lass disappeared on September 6th of 1970, working the 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. shift at the Sahara Tahoe Hotel and Casino in State Line, Nevada. Not in South Lake Tahoe. She lived in South Lake Tahoe at the Monte Verde apartment complex, and it was a 16-minute walk to the Sahara Tahoe Hotel and Casino. And it has since been renamed the Hard Rock Hotel. She was working until 2 a.m. She disappeared at some time between 1.40 a.m. and 2 a.m. I think it's probably around 1.45 a.m., and how do we know that she was murdered? Was her body ever found? No. I mean, were her rem any type of physical remains or any clues at all leading to Donna's whereabouts discovered? I mean, no, and I genuinely do mean this. I mean, I believe she was murdered. It doesn't mean that you, could, you should say it like that, that both of these murders linked to the Zodiac by others. I mean, accidental death. Someone could have lured her to a different location, and she could have fallen into harm's way in a way that was not relevant to murder. I mean, like, think of all the um, possibilities out there. And I go through a lot of this in the Donna Last series, which, again, I invite you guys to listen to everything on this channel, as well as uh, visiting the Launchpad one page where you can download the show for free, and, of course, Amazon.com, the Teespring page, all of that. But I just really don't like the phrasing of this article. In 1974, Gary Post moved his girlfriend and future wife Mary and her 10-year-old son, Mark, along with his future business partner Rod Hamlin and family, to Groveland, California, a small town in the Sierras. Though only 300 people live in Groveland, 2 million people pass through it each year because it is the town nearest to Yosemite National Park. All right, now, th this is one where I said, um... One example where I said the Nancy Drew channel has done some very good um, investigations, I mean, you might even think that that's a weird sentence. Okay, this guy moves his girlfriend and his stepson to a different town. There's nothing weird about that, but he moves his business partner to a new town. I mean, that just struck me as a very oddly phrased sentence. And the Nancy Drew channel uncovered that uh, Rodney Hamlin did not move to Groveland in 1974. He went back through some records, and he actually found that he moved to Groveland in 1976, two years after Gary Post had moved to Groveland, California. But this is all well past the Zodiac era. And I do have to confess that I found, um, I think it's in episode 91, where the um, there is a recording that has been played on the Nancy Drew channel where he says that he found this tape of Rodney Hamlin saying that he was the Zodiac Killer, and it's like, this is meant to be played after my death, and it's a posthumous confession, or it's meant to be played in like, like a posthumous confession where Rodney Hamlin would be talking about confessing to the Lake Herman Road murders, and even saying that David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen were murdered because he, um, because he knew that there were cars that were always parked there along the side of the road. And that's a very common theory about the first confirmed Zodiac incident, where people think that it was just a place where teenagers went frequently, and that's why a crime took place. If you have a single perpetrator theory, or that there is a genuine Zodiac killer out there, then that's why he went to Lake Herman Road, because teenagers were always parked on the side of the road there, and uh, some people have brought in their theories. They think it's a place where people would go just to have a beer, or maybe smoke some marijuana, and then they would drive off, and if you look at the Lake Herman Road parking lot today, I believe the fence, the entrance to the Benicia water, water pumping station, is actually much closer to the road than it was in 1969, so it was actually a more suitable place to pull off to the side of the road. But it was frequented by teenagers, that's it. And also, um, what is it, Rodney Hamlin had a brother who lived in Vallejo at the time, and he would have been it would be very it would have been very easy for him to drive Lake Herman Road to get to his brother's location. That was also mentioned in the Nancy Drew video. And then um once you get to the Blue Rock Springs shooting, 
It's possible that there was a genuine dispute between Peggy Hamlin and Darlene Farron, and that made her the victim, that that was the reason why Rodney Hamlin could have followed her to Blue Rock Springs Park, or he instructed Gary Post to follow him to follow her, excuse me, to Blue Rock Springs Park on July 4th, 1969. And there are all types of um, explanations that have been provided in uh, those videos. Once again, you can watch 74, 75, 76 on the Nancy Drew channel, and episode 91 was actually the first one that Hot Rock Ricky shared with me. So there are theories. There has been a narrative that has been established and constructed. I found, though, that... Um, one of the points that I think is much stronger in the theory that Rodney Hamlin is the Zodiac rather than Gary Post is the physical appearance. I don't really think Gary Post matches a lot of the witness descriptions. If you look at the photo of Rodney Hamlin with a flat top haircut, I think he is more of, of what the Zodiac composite sketch seems to look like, particularly the hairline where he doesn't actually have the conventional widow's peak. It's more just that his hair comes forward in the middle and he has a very um, narrow face and his chin forms into a point, not like some of these suspects who have that moon-faced look like Arthur Lee Allen. And um, I mean, it's just that. I think that he has some physical features that seem more familiar to the composites than oh, some other people out there. And again, he's a guy who's 5 feet 11 inches tall. He would have weighed 200 pounds in 1969. He would have been 29 years old. He's meeting a lot of the parameters. And um, he also did have a military background, I believe, in the Navy, actually. Gary Post was Air Force, and Rodney Hamlin was Navy, and he was involved with, like, I want to say junior cadets in high school, but do not quote me on that one. Please do not quote me on that one. I mean, I'm being very honest with you guys. I think that he is a he's a decent suspect on in terms of comparison to Gary Post. Do I think this guy was the Zodiac Killer at all? No. For one of the reasons that I've already stated, I do not like the methodology. I mean, we could go and find Ross Sullivan's best friend if he had one, which I don't think he did. We could say, find Ross Sullivan's brother. So I'm just say, yeah, he's the Zodiac. Or that one theory out there that Randy Kenny, the guy that brought Louis Myers forward, was the Zodiac, saying just because a per person A has a connection to the Zodiac Killer mystery, then person B was the Zodiac Killer. I don't like it. I don't think it's practical. I think it's a wild goose chase. And it's just taking a person who is between 5 feet 8 inches tall and 6 feet tall and then trying to find factors that um, would link them to being the Zodiac Killer. So I think that it's starting in the wrong place. However, there is definitely some intelligence coming from the Nancy Drew channel talking about how there is this uh, straight line from Brentwood all the way to Blue Rock Springs, as well as this um, reason why he would have been very familiar with the back roads of California, even though he didn't live there. Again, he lived in Alameda and Groveland. And also, it would show that there is um, a better explanation about why the case breakers were on to Gary Post, but all his evidence doesn't match up. I do have to reiterate one point, and that is that the mainstream media really let us down. Because after Gary Post was brought forward as a suspect, the case breakers put out their press release saying that they had solved the Zodiac Killer mystery, and particularly Fox News and TMZ ran with the story, and they were the ones that set the fire, were saying, investigators say the Zodiac Killer case has been solved. Well, what they left out of the headlines were that a team of independent investigators say that they have solved the Zodiac Killer mystery. I mean, I'm an independent investigator. You're an independent investigator. Anybody can say that. They made it sound like there were people who were currently in law enforcement, but they were not. And that's why the Gary Post theory receives credibility. I think Gary Post is one of the worst suspects that I've ever heard about. And 
Rodney Hamlin is a better suspect. I just I just think that it's an inappropriate starting point, and there's a little bit too much of trying to force in the details to make the theory work. Like, it's just that it's forcing um, a theory on a set of parameters or trying to make them fit within a set of parameters, rather. Now, to go back to uh, some different material, I would like to share some unfinished thoughts that I had about last week's episode. Last week on Black Box Online Radio, I did uh, a segment on the 1978 letter. And another point that I would really like to reiterate is most people believe the Zodiac Killer stopped writing letters in 1974 with the Exorcist letter. But there's a letter that was written in 1978. This is the Zodiac speaking. I am back with you. The one that begins like that. And um, that is one that is very frequently compared to the Melvin Belli letter. And I was actually contacted by Drew Zer, whose real name is Andrew. He was a guy who was praised very highly on ZodiacCiphers.com. And he noticed a lot of similarities between the Melvin Belli letter, which is thought to have been an authentic Zodiac communication. It contained a piece of Paul Stein's bloody shirt. But I noticed that Drew Zer thought it was authentic because he's looking at the similarities between the 78 letter and the Melvin Belli letter. They think they're by the same person. Richard Grinnell also looked at the 78 letter, the Melvin Belli letter, written by the same person. Thomas Henry Horne looked at the 78 letter, the Melvin Belli letter, says they were by the same person. Me, Ned from Black Box Online Radio, looks at the Melvin Belli letter and the 78 letter and says they're by the same person. All for different reasons. All for different reasons. We're all coming at this from different standpoints. A prime way to highlight this is... Uh, Druzer and uh, Richard Grinnell were pointing out that the 1978 letter, it, they're, they're looking at the spacing and the words and the way they're structured, saying this is the Zodiac speaking I. And if you look at the Melvin Belli letter, it says this is the Zodiac speaking I. And the words are spaced in the same way. This is the Zodiac speaking and the letter I are only on the top line of the letter. That's all that's written. And what I looked at was the penmanship on the word Zodiac, which I think is not only similar, but extraordinarily similar. So that would mean that the um, 78 letter and the Melvin Belli letter could very well be have written by the same person. And if the Melvin Belli letter contained a piece of Paul Stein's bloody shirt, then either it's both are authentic Zodiac communications, or there is an active participant who was working on those, because that's what Thomas Henry Horne says. His idea is it's about motive. He thinks that the same person wrote the 78 letter and the Melvin Belli letter because they had a motive and a reason to do so. And, well, um, he accuses Robert Graysmith of being an active participant in the Zodiac Killer mystery and that he wanted to drum up uh, some publicity for uh, the Zodiac Killer in 1978 because he was trying to launch his Zodiac Killer book. And Horan really accuses Graysmith of doing a lot of this, not only for profit, but if he was an active participant, it is a way of killing two birds with one stone. He can cover his own tracks, and he can also turn himself into a hero who's earning lots of money in this. He's like a true crime legend, so to speak, and even though a lot of people have debunked Graysmith here in and here out. And I think that, um, I just think it's so interesting that we all came to the same conclusion using very different methodologies. But on that note, I would just like to say that you can always um, look more into some material uh, for this show at Launchpad 1. You can look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned DeHaan, and that is a novel murder mystery inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but of course it is fictional, and that is available on Amazon. And you can visit the Teespring page. Feel free to have a look at some of the merchandise, and remember that being weird is not a crime. What do you think about this guy, uh, Rodney Hamlin, as the Zodiac Killer? His full name was Rodney Lewis Hamlin, and he is a um, he is from Alameda, California, moved to Groveland, California. And I do have one final thing that I almost forgot to say, and it's a point that I will actually challenge on the Nancy Drew channel, and that is that he posted a photo of Rodney Hamlin in episode 75, where he has um, his hair slicked back, and he said that Mike Michaud's description of the Zodiac Killer at Blue Rock Springs was that he couldn't make out any discernible features of the Zodiac's face other than it's really big, 
but he did say that his hair was exactly like the way that Rodney Hamlin's look looks in his yearbook where it's slicked back and I don't recall reading that all I remember is that Mike Michaud said that his hair was reddish brown maybe with some curls but th that is quite different than uh slicked back so to speak but um maybe it's something that I have overlooked I just wanted to throw that in there but what do you think about um any of this and what do you think about Rodney Hamlin as a Zodiac Killer suspect? Do you think the Nancy Drew channel is on the right track? And I guess I would just um, ask the question in a different way. Do you believe that this is a good starting point by looking at someone who just has a familiar connection to Gary Post and trying to build a case from there? And let's be clear, the case breakers have not solved anything. They said that they solved the case, and then they said they're trying to harvest Gary Post's DNA that means they have not solved the case yet. It's just they, they have a Zodiac killer suspect. They haven't solved Diddley Squad otherwise, then they would have released a full profile. Then they would have his DNA, and they would have compared his DNA to the things that extracted from the Zodiac killer letters. If they could have done it for Arthur Lee Allen, they could have done it for Gary Post, and they would say, that, oh, this DNA matches, and his side palm print slash writer's palm matches to the 74 Exorcist letter. None of that is present. They don't have anything. I don't believe anything the case breakers do, and I don't even know who Kathy Joe Bates is, people who are on their side. So there's a lot of stuff going around on the internet, and a lot of it is not true. What do you think about any of this? Please put your ideas down in the comments section down below, and I will see you on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.